So thank you for having me. I um, spoke with Anna Sachs and Matt um, about some of the issues that I encounter my work in the park system. And, and we thought uh, it would be a worthwhile presentation. Um, but uh, please feel free to, I have some slides to, to kind of share and organize some of what I wanted to present. But um, if, if you would like to moderate any, any comments as I go, um, hopefully we can have a conversation afterwards. Um, but just a little background, um, I've been working for the New York Restoration Project for 15 years. Prior to that, I was uh, an art teacher um, and a landscaper and doing a variety of things. Uh, while I've been at MRP, I, I've gotten more and more interested in environmental science, um, pursued a master's degree there, and um, it's become a big part of how I think about the restoration work MRP does. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, New York Restoration Project was founded by Bette Midler in 1995. We're a not-for-profit uh, whose mission is to restore and program green space in underserved areas throughout the city. And that has looked like uh, different programs at different times in our history. Um, we were founded to pick up garbage on the west side of uh, Northern Manhattan in Fort Tryon and Fort Washington parks. Um, since then, our work in parks has um, focused on the east side of Northern Manhattan. So you can see um, on my screen here on the uh, right oh, side. Oh, Jason, um, yeah. we actually can't see your screen. Oh, sorry. Um, well, you didn't miss too much yet. Um, I guess there's something I need to do to share it. Here we go. The share screen button would do that would be the one. All right. Um, Got it. All right. So um, I was super excited to um, I talk a lot about our work and I talk a lot about our natural restoration work, um, but I don't talk a lot about garbage in parks. Um, so I'm, I'm really um, thrilled to get to spend some time with people who are interested in this subject. Um, and, and part of why I think it's important is because um, we tend to talk about it as litter, um, but I think the the what we encounter in parks actually has some substantial policy um, and environmental concerns that, that are beyond just sort of like litter removal, um, which is kind of how MRP first started thinking about it. Um, when we started our work, as I said, on the west side, and now we're focused on the east side of Northern Manhattan. Um, we take care of about 80 acres um, in partnership with the Parks Department, uh, including the northern half of Highbridge Park, two miles of the Harlem River Greenway that run along um, the bike path from about Dykeman Street to about 100, uh, 170th Street, and then uh, Sherman Creek Park, which is a park that's kind of been, been developed in multiple phases on the Harlem River. Um, we start, uh, uh, the organization has grown a lot from trash removal where we, where we first started. Million Trees Initiative was a major partnership with the city and we also own and operate community gardens and help build community gardens around the city, but we still start every day with trash pickup um, for better or worse. It's a big part of what we do. Um, so I, I normally all my PowerPoints are filled with pictures of pretty flowers, um, but in honor of you all, I wanted to cut right to the garbage. Um, and, 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 you know, central to MRP's work is, is um, thinking about equity in green space. Um, and thankfully, it's come to the fore in a lot of conversations uh, more recently. Um, but it's um, certainly manifest in, in litter. You know, um, city services um, and investment in green space is still radically unequal. Um, and this is an example. This is a section of Highbridge Park um, that's adjacent to the Polo Grounds houses. Um, one of the largest NYCHA properties in Manhattan. Um, very little access to green space and um, large chunk of the park um, is really, is a, is a illegal dumping ground that is similar to, you know, the, the a lot of the conditions um, that was more common in New York City parks 
you know, many years ago could be found in more high profile parks. It still persists in parks um, where um, the communities don't have the resources or, or the voice um, that's needed. And so uh, this is from a few years ago that we've made, you know, the community and the parks department um, has made quite a bit of progress um, cleaning up this section. But um, just to include it, you know, this, this is an area where um, there's not good access to transportation, there's not, not good access to green space, and it's just um, overlapping social problems in the polo grounds and, and just compounded by litter is just really a manifestation of much deeper inequality. Um, you know, and at its most extreme, we, we um, have ongoing challenges and growing challenges with homeless encampments or unhoused folks living in our parks. And um, that just gets, I think, to part of where I wanted to, to, to bring my presentation to you all is that um, thinking about litter in parks, we, we have to very quickly start thinking um, much more broadly about social problems and um, things that, that are maybe more important than litter, you know, like trying to live safely and with dignity, but we can't really solve the litter problem in parks if we don't think simultaneously about addressing the housing crisis and the opioid crisis and, and a number of other, other issues that we grapple with. Um, now we're moving on from Highbridge Park to the Harlem River Greenway. This is a, 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 a morning. So, so this is, um, I think, more what we might think of as parks litter. And, and it's um, <clears throat> this is a particularly bad morning, but you know we have a lot of these um, weekend mornings. If anyone's familiar with Northern Manhattan or or, or, or Van Cortlandt Park or, or any, you know even Prospect Park, well-resourced parks will look like this often uh, on a morning after a holiday weekend. Um, and this, I think, <clears throat> is worth some consideration as well because I don't think. Um, the nonprofit partners in the parks department were, were sort of equipped to deal with litter on a small scale, but we, we have pretty large informal events, which, you know, um, for better or worse, are, are, are sort of have become part of how people are using parks. And um, we don't, um, the waste stream isn't separated, none of it's recycled, um, there's not adequate facilities for all these events. So we have like a little bit of a mismatch between how we've sort of informally decided to use our green space and how we're dealing with the waste management. You know, and I think there are models for how, how that could be looked at. You know, there are places where one can try to more intentionally encourage people to remove trash and so rather than, than leave stuff behind. So, you know, I think um, right now our messaging to the public is, is to sort of do their best to put stuff in trash bags and then we remove it all, but it's not the best way to handle it. It's not what our staff is really there for. You know, we're, um, our crew, if we weren't spending the whole day um, picking up litter, would be um, working on restoration projects, gardening, education projects, kind of doing the hard work of adapting our landscape to climate change and teaching people how to appreciate it. And, um, you know, so it's a, it's a tough, um, it's a tough thing to do to, um, staff that are not, um, we're not a unionized um, garbage hauling outfit. And, and so, and that's the case for many parks workers across the city. So I think it's really, um, it's an issue of also kind of like treating our workplace, our work crews fairly that I think we need to do a little better job thinking about it. Um, but there's also policy issues. So th this is an old photo. Most of my photos are pretty recent. Um, but it's an example uh, that struck me at the time how how policy can impact dumping in parks in unexpected or maybe expected ways. So not long after the city um, stopped collecting electronic waste at the curbside, we saw uh, an explosion of televisions throughout the park system. And um, we still see a lot of televisions and e-waste. And again, the, the parks department um, and the nonprofits that work with them were not really set up to handle this appropriately. And so um, not all of it gets dealt with the way it should be. Um, and so I think there, there's a real need to kind of like align resources with the reality that is generated by, by the kind of policies that we get. Um, extends to bathroom use. 
uh, a, a maybe outside. I'm not sure if it falls under the solid waste umbrella, but uh, thankfully it's an issue that's getting a lot of attention in the city, but um, we, we don't have adequate facilities for people using green space and open space to go to the bathroom. And again, it just becomes a major quality of life issue in the city if um, people are making their own bathrooms. And um, again, it, it's a challenge for, for the folks who, who have to take clean up these spaces. This is right next to an elementary school. It, you know, so it's, it's sort of, um, it's not healthy. It's not an ideal way to use our public space. And I, I think we could continue to do better. Um, Really, one of my take home messages that I think um, I don't, I'm not a policy wonk, definitely not when it comes to solid waste policy, but in my opinion, anything that we make hard to dispose of um, comes to the parks. And so, cooking grease is a great example. Um, these are our, our cooking grease left out by neighborhood restaurants, um, comes into the park system. And again, I can only hope it's disposed of as well as possible, but but it's not really what's supposed to be happening with used cooking grease. Um, not all of it comes from small businesses and park users. Our, our city agencies and subcontractors for city agencies in underserved areas um, regularly don't dispose of, of construction debris. And that, especially in natural areas and underserved areas and parks, if you put a shovel in the ground, you're gonna encounter many generations of dumped concrete. Um, and so it's something that we also need to look at how, you know, subcontractors for the DOT operate in um, underserved neighborhoods when they're done repaving a road, what happens to the extra asphalt and who's out there making sure that it gets dealt with properly. Um, so this is just a little, um, like I said, I. I I spent a lot of time thinking about what's dumped in parks and I don't often get to talk about it. So I had a lot of fun making this little collage of some of the types of things we'll find in the parks that are a little hard to figure out what to dispose of. But even a regulation as benign as saying you have to wrap your mattresses in plastic to prevent the spread of bed bugs will lead to dumping of mattresses in, in green space. Um, one of the issues we wanted to spend a little time thinking about is um, IV needles. It's an ongoing crisis in, in green space, um, particularly the spots we care for in Northern Manhattan. Um, in July, NYRP removed um, over 1,200 used needles from High Bridge Park. And um, it's a park that the city has invested a lot of money in restoring and trying to get people to use. We spend a lot of time restoring the forest. It's a beautiful forest and we love it, but it's really hard to do if it's filled with needles. Um, it's dangerous. Um, it's hard to encourage people to use the parks if we um, can't guarantee that they're reasonably safe. Um, and it's an example, it's right, it's a solid waste problem. We have to figure out what to do with these needles. It's not easy to get rid of them. At the moment, we work with a nonprofit partner called the Corner Project. Otherwise, we would have to bring them to a public hospital. Um, so there's a lot of temptations to dispose of these things improperly and not safely. Um, but the solution is not just figuring out how to dispose of them properly. It's, it's really figuring out how to provide people safe injection sites and deal with all the social challenges that are needed. People don't particularly want to be shooting up in a park, um, living in a park, but um, they're forced there out of necessity. And so I think. Um, any effort to deal with this litter challenge is, is got to sort of start to deal with the opioid challenge as well. Um, so this is a big survey. I'm jumping around to a lot of big challenges, but um, you know, I think they're all um, areas for great improvement and great optimism. So what we're looking at here is the gallery caused by an invasive beetle larvae on an elm tree. Um, in case you all aren't aware, we're in the middle of an invasion from the emerald ash borer, which is an invasive beetle that's killing out all, all the members of the ash genus in our region. So it's it's really um, quietly moving, um, pretty significant ecological catastrophe, potentially significant extinction event if it, if it really continues to be um, near universal mortality of ash trees. So it's, it's, it's a terrible, ecological problem, um, but it's also a waste management problem. Um, 
we have a lot of organic material that comes out of parks and, and out of our green spaces and out of our street trees. And I think that alone could be a topic for you know a, a long presentation and conversation. There's a lot of variables in, in how it's used and constraints and how it can be used. But um, we know when we have ecological catastrophes, we can have pretty dramatic increases in organic material that needs to be dealt with. We know if we don't have the capacity, it doesn't get dealt with well after Hurricane Sandy. Large numbers of trees were incinerated at Floyd Bennett Fields. You know, we we um, have trees that will get landfilled and organic material that gets landfilled if we don't have the capacity to um, use it, either compost it, turn it into wood chips. Um, there's other more innovative things that we could do that would be even better um, ecologically, like generating biochar, um, using salvaged lumber. So there's a lot that we can do to increase capacity to handle organics within our park system, um, including, I think, you know, a lot more capacity for compost and integrating composting into our system. Right now, we do a great job. Um, the city, this is Cunningham Park, where um, many of the trees that come down throughout the city are turned into wood chips, which are then um, reutilized throughout the park system. Um, but this is just a, a little touch of, of the volume of organic waste that um, moves around the city. Um, and you can imagine when you have a big increase it, from an event like the Emerald Ash Borer that, that will be killing a lot of trees over the next couple of years, um, you have to think about that extra capacity. And, and that's the kind of event that we'll be, should expect to see more of as, as climate change um, further destabilizes our urban ecosystems. Um, one thing I think about a lot, um, you know, I mentioned I, I, I'm a student of environmental science and ecology. I'm particularly interested in, in urban soils and soil formation. And um, I would say in a lot of our neglected park spaces, they have such a long legacy of dumping that we really have to think about um, litter as one of the main ingredients of our urban soils. Even in, as you can see here, we have layers of buried carpet and trees and vegetation above it. So we have a lot of areas like this where we have um, such a deep legacy of dumping that it really profoundly shapes um, the ecosystem that's that's now on top of it. Even places that don't have this obvious dumping are, are heavily influenced by um, the built environment and, and you know, just aerial deposition of, of dust and, and construction debris. My, um, this is a little slide I pulled from, from a publication NYRP did on the chemical properties of the soils in Highbridge Park. Um, the bright orange are, are high pH areas of the soil where our native forest trees struggle to establish. And we think that's primarily driven by dumped concrete that has leached into the soils. And so that's gonna shape the trajectory of the forest for you know, many hundreds of years likely. So it's really become kind of part of how we think about the ecosystem evolving and, and um, just another way that, um, you know, when we think about garbage and litter in the parks, we can think about um, policy, social challenges, but we also want to think about socio-ecological relationships. Um, right now at Sherman Creek, we have about 19 raccoons, which um, my crew loves and thinks are very cute. They live in the dumpster um, because of all the garbage that we have to process um, and that sits in the park before it gets shipped out. Um, but those raccoons have also impacted our wetland restoration where we we're working to try to restore mussel populations. But because we have this unnatural um, high level of raccoons um, eating all the mussels, it's kind of shaped how we can do wetland restoration and what's possible. And when you talk to wetland scientists um, or you know the folks who plan wetland restorations around the city, they don't often think about, um, are you storing garbage? near your wetland because that's gonna make it hard to establish mussels. But it, it's one of the one of the unexpected kind of ecological impacts we have from our garbage problem. And, and as you can imagine, there are lots of them. Um, but, you know, um, like I, I, I was stressing some of the challenges, but um, all the solutions are great. You know, um, composting can be integrated into every park in the city. So it's not just, processing the organic materials we develop from the park. Um, but if we do it well, we can actually take um, organic material from the surrounding neighborhood. 
and it can all be to redound to the benefit of the park. Um, we can start to think about um, all the materials that come in and out of the park um, in, in from more of a circular economy perspective. And, and actually, I think, look to our green spaces, not necessarily as places where we are solving all the city's problems, but, but can actually contribute to waste management problems. Um, so that's, that's, I think, where I wanted to stop but hopefully a little food for thought. Um, and I, I'd love to, to answer any questions if you have any. Jason, I'll jump in here. Um, that was so fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for putting that together and for raising all these issues. We have one question from Daniil. What percent of your work crew's time is spent on waste related issues? I would we probably have have a, a, the numbers to answer that, but I would say probably thirty percent. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have some questions in the uh, in the uh, in the chat. <clears throat> I mean, in the uh, Maggie, you, you want you had your hand up, so did you want to ask a question? Yes, uh, introduce myself as a uh, Northern Manhattan local. I uh, founded and uh, president of the Ring Garden at Dykeman and Broadway. You may have passed by it. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a question which pertains to perhaps some of the gardens. And um, that is that the uh, parks still won't pick up recyclables, even if they're all separated for them. They won't put out any recycling bins. And uh, that being, you know, our main reason for being here, um, is that something that NYRP is interested in, uh, you know, working together possibly to get a, a bill in the city council and funding for having recycling in parks? Um. I'm first of all, uh, nice to meet you, Maggie. I've heard your name uh, for many years. Um, also, I also live in Northern Manhattan. Um, and I, I can say I think it's a huge problem. Um, and I can't speak to NYRP's kind of position on a public advocacy issue. You know, in general, our approach to our work is, is to. Um, be fairly conservative and cautious when it comes to public advocacy. Um, you know, my my role is is to sort of talk about how we manage the land, and and as you can see, I have a lot of opinions about uh, that I think have policy implications, but I can't speak to um, NYRP necessarily endorsing a specific policy position. But I could certainly um, internally advocate it for it and and connect you with the the folks at NYRP who who could kind of make that decision. If, if you think it would be a, a valuable conversation to follow up on. I think it would. Like, I know we, we, we came out in support of the plastic bag bill, but, um, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff isn't our, it's not in our wheelhouse normally. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a couple of questions. Um, so have you, have you seen an impact from the that plastic bag, bag, bag ban? plastic from trees or what have you. That's really tough to say, um, particularly because of its overlap with COVID um, and it's kind of uneven adoption. Um, I want to say there has been a reduction, but but I, I, it's it's hard to say. You know, we, we spend a fair amount of time in the winter pulling trees, uh, plastic bags out of trees with um, like a grappling hook on an extension pole we call a bag snagger. Um, and I think the um, the demands for that work have been have been diminished, but I, I can't say for sure. Sure. And then I, it's obvious from you know when we talked on the phone with Anna, you, myself, and you, um, <clears throat> didn't really resonate with me as deeply as looking at the photographs that you brought. Right. You know the photographs of the of the of the materials in the park, the, the illegal dumping and the at the waste as a result of just using the park, right? And and so those are two distinct waste streams that originate from two different sources, right? One is using the park and the other is like, you know, contractors and just 
restaurants and stuff. If you were to think of a solution for the illegal dumping, is do you have like any thoughts on how you would attack that problem uh, first, and then I'd ask follow up on the question with you know just park usage. Yeah. So so I mean my my um, I, I would love to see. Um, the incentives for small businesses being different. Um, I would love to see everyone taxed enough that the city could just deal with the cooking oil and the construction debris from small contractors. You know, I don't understand why small restaurants don't just pay a tax and then the city can deal with the cooking grease responsibly um, rather than kind of having these private truckers um, and, and, and an incentive for dumping. So, so personally, I think that the best approach is to um, not not try to, you know, enforcement in large natural areas is very difficult. Um, you know, to to set up like a sting operation to catch a small business dumping is is I think kind of a backwards thing to do about it. To have to throw fences up around green spaces because you're afraid of dumping, which happens right in underserved neighborhoods, and then you're cutting off low income neighborhoods from green space. I mean, all those options are really the bad, not good options. So I, I, I think ideally you want to have a system that that um, that that removes the incentive, the financial incentive for a small business to dump to begin with. Um, and then I would say, you know, the Parks Department doesn't. Um, they also don't advocate necessarily for dealing with this stuff. But I think within the city, we need to make sure that the folks that are going to be having to deal with this stuff are, are given the right appropriate tools to properly dispose of it. I know, you know, when, when we have a car abandoned in the park space or a boat is abandoned or people dump concrete, it's like it's the first time it's happened and no one knows what to do with it because it's the agency really isn't, again, they're sort of built for a little bit of litter. They're not really built for the dumping that they experience. So those are my only two two suggestions. Um, uh, let's go to Debbie Lee Cohen. Hi, Jason. Thanks so much. It was great. And I really appreciate you're talking about these overlapping issues, socio socioeconomic issues that you know most of us don't think about. Um, I run an organization called Cafeteria Culture. We do a lot of street litter cleanups and beach litter cleanups, but not park cleanups. And I think what you said, and you answered part of this question already about anything that's hard to dispose of comes to the parks, which a lot of us don't see. You know, you have to get up early in the morning in some parts of Manhattan to see that. You get up early, you go to the park and you see what they're cleaning up. And actually I was gonna say something connecting to what Maggie's saying. I think we don't think of that kind of dumping necessarily as an urban issue. You see it in other places. If you live in other parts of the country, you see quickly how dumping becomes a giant issue and what other parts of the country, more rural parts of the country are doing about it. So that's what I was gonna say. Like, I think like, how do we innovate some new ideas really around dumping in particular you know, yes, like policy has to change, but also Maggie, I like your idea of videos, video and, you know, can we, can we, you know, do like we do for idling, you know, that pass a policy that if you have a video of somebody dumping and, you know, that doesn't seem like the ideal kind of situation, but what can the swab do? Because we do focus on policy. And I guess that's a question that uh, Matt already asked you and you answered that pretty well, but I feel like we could dig deeper into it. We could find more solutions around that and in particular around policy. Like what could we support? Jason, did you? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I, I was thinking, I mean, I, I, I think that my, my, that was, I already sort of said my one or two big ideas, um, you know, and then I, I think um, I talked about a lot of different categories of things. I think probably the other big category that I feel strongly about is um, is kind of sustainable management and circular reuse of materials. And and like there, uh, there's a lot of easy wins there that the city just isn't doing. You know, like I I, I don't know if you all are familiar with like the um, the the pure soil program from the uh, OER. Um, where soil, instead of being trucked out of the city, is available for use. Um, but it's like, 
it's really just um, a fraction of the kind of program that could be done to reuse materials um, in green spaces. And, and you know, the, the, the easy place to look is sort of organic, um, organic waste and how organics are processed and cycled. Um, and, and again, it's just a big change in culture in, in how spaces are managed and how we think about the materials that um, come in and out of those spaces. Um, but we could do, you know, a lot of those areas are wonderful wins for better parks. You know, the more compost we use, the more um, our soils help sequester carbon and, and rainwater. So, so it's sort of, and then it reduces CSO. So there's a lot of like, like more positive things we can do with um, being much more um, inter cross jurisdictional and and cross agency in terms of how materials are cycled through our parks. Um, and, and that's kind of like, it's another policy area where I see a lot of um, bureaucratic um, hurdles to common sense solutions that, that would improve public space and reduce waste pretty dramatically. And that's kind of, would fall in the bucket of, I think, sustainable management of green space. Excellent. Um, so uh, Alex, Alex, you've got, a, Alex Morgan, you've got a, a question, I think. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I just, really quick, I want to say thanks for you know working on this issue because it's sort of like a, a maximally difficult area to um, to deal with, and you know you in a lot of ways have a minimum amount of control over it. So you know hats off to anybody who's who's working on it. But I was wondering what you think about um, maybe uh, exerting you know, a pressure over the things that the, like the events that happen in parks that the city has a really solid control over. So like maybe the way, for example, like the, the band shell is operated or, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, Smorgasburg in, um, Smorgasburg in, uh, what is that, Prospect Park. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, uh, on the slightly smaller scale, maybe any sort of um, uh, like farmer's market that's running in the park, if, if we could maybe use those as, uh, what do you think about using those as like a, getting our foot in the door of, you know, running large events in parks uh, in a responsible way? Because um, a, a lot of those yeah. are like very high waste events currently. I think that's a great idea, um, you know, because um, I, I hate I hate to think of, you know, like the use of the Harlem River Greenway is, is a critical use for folks who live nearby that really need to get out and, and, and have um, some social opportunities, some events, but at the same time to have kind of unregulated Barbecuing throughout green space, it's just not really sustainable for the city and, and the impacts are, are, are terrible in terms of waste that's generated and impact on the landscape. So I think investing in, in responsibly run programming that, that has kind of good waste management values built in would be a great kind of non-punitive way to go about it. Because, you know, I think that there's been... Um, at various points, we've had more aggressive intervention from NYPD to to limit large unofficial gatherings, and, and you know I think there's a lot of um, mixed feelings about having NYPD in that role for kind of like lifestyle, you know, to enforce barbecuing. You know, it's not not necessarily I think a direction a lot of people feel comfortable with. But how how does the city kind of collectively say? But this is the way that public space should be used appropriately. Uh, I think it gets to the bathroom problem. If you don't actually have bathrooms, it's very hard to enforce people going to the bathroom in public. Um, so I think that's great. And, and I, I just wanted to also mention, not directly related to your comment, Alex, but I, I didn't mean to suggest that um, there hasn't been progress in the spaces that, that um, NYRP works on and in spaces throughout the city. Um, you know, Sherman Creek Park, when it was first built, was an illegal garbage dump, and now it's like a gorgeous um, farm and botanical garden almost. And, and you know, generally, MRP's model of like community outreach and cleaning up a space and beautifying it, like that does work. Um, and I didn't mean to suggest that that model doesn't contribute to a change in, in dumping and litter. Um, 
but I, I also, um, I think that, I just think we can do more and, and there's a, there are other ways to think about it. Do we have a couple more questions? Um, uh, Wendy, I'm sorry, I, I missed your, I think you've had your hand up for a while, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. Hi, this is Wendy Frank. Um, I live a block away from Jackie Robinson Park. And last week there was a big uh, event sponsored by a radio station who took big um, posters and taped and taped and taped them on all over the neighborhood. Um, the event happened where they gave giveaways of food, a, a, a big massive truck came, people, it was like one of those supermarket uh, shows where people just came with their carts and grabbed food and left. And they left such garbage. And I was just like, this is a kind of an event where um, you wonder who, you know, the radio station sponsored it, but they left tons and tons of garbage. So I don't know even like if they have a pre-meeting with the organization, a pre and a post meeting with the organization to say, you know, give us some money because you've left us some, you know, like find them or some kind of um, debris uh, pickup um, kind of um, agreement at, you know, for an event because yeah. there was I mean, an event like that, that is sort of official should have a parks department um, special events permit, which which has a deposit and has parameters around what's supposed to happen. Um, yeah, so that does sound um, sounds egregious and hopefully there was some mechanism for um, some accountability um, because that's not the kind of thing the park staff they don't like to get left with something like that. Right. Um, so, so uh, I, I think in general there is for for like sponsored official events. I think there there sort of is a mechanism in place that that basically works to keep people from being too destructive. Yeah, this was quite the eyesore. Um, the other thing is, I live in northern Manhattan, and um, you pointed it out, out about the Harlem Greenway. Um, have you observed? I I bike that like twice a week. To, and head over into the Yonkers area. And you talk about managing the land. The sidewalks on the way from like for people to get to access. I don't know if you observe the sidewalks near the Wrangell Apartments to get up the little hill to get to the access to get down to the water and the debris over there. Yes, I have observed it. Um, and I, I, I don't like to say that's outside my area, but it's just outside my, you know, we have MRP has um, a pretty um, clear license agreement with the New York City Parks Department to, to make sure that we, we sort of, um, you know, operate in a way that is predictable and we can collaborate well. And um, yeah, the, the access from down to the Harlem River Greenway is definitely um, mm -hmm. not, not what it should be. Okay, I agree. We have, we have a question from Gabriella. Hi, um, I'm gonna echo everyone else, Jason, and say thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I loved what you talked about. Uh, well, I didn't love it, I suppose, but I thought it was very interesting when you were talking about the quality of the soil um, and the sort of legacy of, of dumping and that image of the carpet, with the trees on top. Um, and I'm curious if you've thought at all about how, or you or anyone that you know, whether composting, sort of increase in urban composting could have a real impact on the quality of the soil in the city or whether it's a bit too late for that. Um, but, you know, to me, those seem like obviously related things and I'm not sure that anybody has like really looked at them together in New York. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the, I, I went back to school to get my master's at Brooklyn College because they had an urban soil program. And, and I learned enough to know that like soil is really complicated and it's, it's hard, hard to have one easy answer. But, but like if there is an easy answer, it's like, yes, we need more compost everywhere. Um, so, so yeah, it does like, it does a lot of good things um, and, and it helps um, sequester heavy metals that are already in the soil. Um, if it's paired with like a clean soil bank, 
material reuse thing. We can actually mix compost that we make on site with pristine soil from under construction sites. So yeah, like we can do a lot. Um, and, and and it's not um, it, it, it's not necessarily all um, like sometimes the legacy of an impact in soils, you're not going to remove it, but but you can definitely mitigate it. And, um, you know, sometimes obviously you could do like drastic things and, and put all new soil in a space. But um, but yeah, composting is if there's one simple thing that we should be doing more of, it's it's composting and and figuring out how to better integrate the compost into the management. I mean, I think, you know, there there organizations in the compost project network around the city ha have done a great job thinking about how how to distribute composting and integrate it into community gardening and stuff but but it's it's harder to scale up and integrate with like larger um, yeah. private and municipal land management organizations there's an interesting scholar who maybe you've encountered named scott kellogg who has a phd in science and technology studies from RPI, and he's now on the faculty at SUNY Albany, but he wrote a great book called Urban Ecosystem Justice, which I have the PDF of, if you're interested. Um, yeah. And he cares a lot about soil and kind of calls for like a critical composting studies um, discipline, you know, because um, it seemed to him it's an area that, at least in academic circles, is maybe not as fleshed out as it could be. Um, but I can send that too. Yeah, it's called. Yeah, I'm happy to send it to the group. It's called Urban Ecosystem Justice. I mean, he's I, a really he, he's I, a cool. I, I, he, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> he's a cool. He's a cool guy who started. He got a PhD, but he also started a kind of community sustainability organization in Albany and like kind of Troy area, which has a lot of legacy pollution, you know, from the Hudson River. So he has like worked a lot in. Um, sort of in the community, in addition to having a lot of scholarly academic expertise on the subject. I, I don't think, um, you know, sometimes people I think 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 that composting is it could can handle like all of New York City's food waste could all just be dumped into our soils, and I, I don't think it's at that scale necessarily. But but I think we could do a lot um, to divert food waste and, and improve soil. Thanks. Allison, you have a question. Yeah, hi. Thank you. That, I mean, uh, very eye opening. Thank you. Uh, disturbing. A um, <clears throat> couple of questions. I guess Wendy's question kind of made me wonder how, if anybody tracks like 311 complaints uh, that are, you know, tied to specific areas, because it just seems, I, I know in, in some, in some issues, like, People just don't know to call three one one, so they don't register complaints. So, you know, nothing is addressed. So, I just had a question on that, and then a second um, question was just about your last slide had pumpkins in it, and I don't know if that was a random slide or if you actually do pumpkin collection type events. It's just something. Uh, I'm chair of the organics committee. I've actually been kind of thinking of doing that and maybe it's a discussion we have offline if it makes any sense. Um, unfortunately, that slide was NYRP used to run um, a compost project at Sherman Creek Park. It was sort of on the scale of like, you know, what what like some of the other compost project organizations would do. Um, but uh, that area was was converted into parkland, and so the compost we don't compost on a large scale anymore. We are always every year we try to help the Inwood pumpkin pageant find a way to compost their pumpkins, and it's a struggle every year. Um, so I, there's a lot of you know a lot of change. Obviously, you all know there there it's a dynamic field right now, um, but but we're not much help unfortunately. Um, but I, I, I would say, like, in the abstract, I, I, my goal would be for, like, every park to have um, uh, a nicely run compost site as, as part of the park, like, rather than the sort of, like, right now there's, like, um, uh, Big Reuse has a pumpkin smash, and I think that's happening on park's property, um, but it's in, like, a closed space. Like, I would love to see composting kind of integrated um, just as part of the landscape. Um, but that's a lot, we're a long way from that. 
And and I guess about three one one. Does anybody track like for that event? Right, Wendy just mentioned. Someone I, someone else might be able to answer that better than me. Um, oh. But could be a useful tool for identifying dumping prob hot spots. Yeah, Thank you. Super. Well, I think if there are no other, oh, there's more, two more questions. Let's go to the. We'll go to if, just go. Uh, Anna, you had a question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, the emerald ash borer and the um, it's right the ash trees that are being affected. Like um, we we spoke earlier about some of the issues with um, possibly composting them and why biochar would be preferred. Um, so you know when you. Well, uh, the, there's often a simultaneous to, you know, we, we have had waves of invasions in our forests of invasive pests that um, can do pretty profound damage to the, our forest. Um, so they're often have different rules around quarantining the wood and moving the wood. And um, that I think has to be part of any like waste management strategy dealing with, with wood in the wake of, of one of these invasive pests. Um, and, and it's part of why I like, I'm a big fan of, I love the idea of having decentralized um, composting and waste management in green spaces. Um, and I am particularly like the emerald ash borer. Um, I forget the details on the quarantine, but you can't move logs around. Um, you know, so normally, right, if a tree comes down and we have to remove it from a path, um, we would um, bring it to Cunningham Park in Queens. But if we are in a quarantine zone and have an invasive insect that we might be spreading around, we can't move that tree. Um, so it becomes much more of a technical challenge. It could be shredded on site. Um, but if, um, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, biochar is, you know, a pretty simple way to, um, burn organic material in the absence of oxygen and you end up sequestering a large amount of CO2 in a fairly recalcitrant form that can be a good amendment to soils, um, can increase the capacity to store organic materials in our soils. Um, and just seeing how much wood we have to move around the city and the challenges with moving wood around in a quarantine situation um, it strikes me that um, making biochar would be a great way to sterilize the wood and, and be able to transport it um, safely. Now, um, making biochar in the city is challenging, right, because to do it in a way that's not polluting requires a furnace. Um, so so it's, it's something that would require like a big investment. It's certainly beyond, it's beyond something that um, an organization like MRP could do. So it's one reason why I talk about it all the time, because it's something that I think it could happen on a municipal level. And if we had a, a biochar facility for organic material in the city, we could safely bring wood that might be contaminated there to be processed safely. And, and it's like, it's a, it's a, if you look at some of the modeling, it's it, a lot of carbon can be kept out of the atmosphere. You know, because even when we compost uh, uh, our, our woody debris, a large proportion of that CO2 goes in the atmosphere. If we landfill it, a lot of it goes back as methane. Um, biochar is, is really one of the best ways to keep woody debris from our urban forests um, from going into the atmosphere. And, and our, our trees, even when they don't have the emerald ash borer in the city, don't have that long of a life. So it's um, uh, techniques for using our wood that can keep the CO2 out of the air, like um, lumber or biochar, I think need a lot more attention. So we're going to have a hard stop just about at the top of the hour. So Sharon, you, you haven't asked a question yet. So would you like to go ahead and ask a question? It's, it, it, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you for this presentation. It's really been wonderful. I, I, I tend to get trees from NYRP every year that you've been giving them out. Um, so thank you. Great. But um, I just surprisingly read uh, an article posted on my LinkedIn feed today about biochar. And I'm wondering, since it is so uh, beneficial to the soil that you put it on, um, and it's a carbon capture, 
wouldn't it make sense to build a facility to produce that, especially if these invasive uh, insect uh, thing types of situations keep happening? And I feel like they have been um, in, in recent years uh, that city parks could really benefit from building that facility. And if you agree with that, would that be something that the Solid Waste Advisory Board could work on with NYRP to get the legislation and budget passed for that or um, advocate for? Yeah, again, I, I would have to punt on NYRP advocating for biochar. I'm kind of like, I'm a little nuts about it because um, I agree with you. It's like, it should have been done a while ago. Um, and, and and it certainly needs to be piloted. Um, every soil is a little different and, and every biochar feedstock is a little different. So it's like, I think it's at the phase where where we need to look at New York City soils and New York City um, organic waste and start piloting the best biochar technology. Um, but it's probably, it's probably not gonna be MRP taking the lead with it. I think it's the kind of thing that um, an organization like MRP could help with. Um, Cornell is probably the leader in the area right now on um, biochar. Um, they have a big biochar furnace that is, I think, helping to advance the, the conversation and the science around it. Um, so yes, uh, I think MRP could be part of the conversation. Um, That's great, thanks. Do you, do you know the people at Cornell that are working on that? I don't have a personal relationship with them. Um, but I can send, I've watched a bunch of their YouTube videos and they're, they're lovely. All right, thanks. All right, um, I, I think we have one last question from Maggie. And Maggie, if you could try to, to make it brief, that'd be great. I'm always brief. Are there enough garbage cans in your estimation uh, in all of the usual all night rave areas uh, like the peninsula at the top of Manhattan, for example, where you know, that every every weekend night there's going to be yeah. a lot of trash and has anybody thought of trying to track that by noise complaints through 311 because i know i'm patched into the noise people uptown and they do use 311 um i don't know any i don't know about the 311 um the garbage can question is hard i don't know that we want enough garbage cans on the peninsula for the peak usage I think probably the usage needs to be a lot less. Um, but I think probably if we're going to uh, live with this high usage, we need a different type of system, something like a enclosed dumpster, um, you know, which the kind of thing that are being piloted for how garbage might be stored on the curbside now. So that's the direction I would go in is looking at, at kind of dumpster type things that can't support pest populations that. Um, if we're going to have large areas where we have, you know, a thousand barbecuers, um, there's, I don't think we want um, 500 open garbage cans necessarily out there. Yeah, I didn't say that, but I, your, your suggestion is helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Jason, I, I want to thank you for spending a, the full hour with us. We were, uh, I think you were wondering whether or not you'd make a full hour, but you certainly did. And that's great. Um, this was a wonderful presentation and discussion. And I think Anna and I will look back with you on some of the open issues that we still have uh, and to see how we both can, uh, the SWAB can cooperate with some of the efforts that you're currently engaged in. Great, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's an honor to talk to folks who are dedicated to, to this issue. Um, and, and I look forward to following up with, with, with several of you. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Thank you, it was great.